My name is Shlomi Ron. I'm the co-founder of the Visual Storytelling Institute. And today I'm super excited to have one of the top infographics experts on our show today. Our guest, uh, as you can see, is Ryan Wallace. Uh, he's the president of the Now Sourcing, one of the world's uh, top infographic design agencies based in Louisville, Kentucky, and Cincinnati, Ohio. He's, he's really has uh, some great success with serving some major clients like Twitter, Google, Pepsi, so welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you so much for having me, Shwami. It's been a pleasure to be here. Apologies for the delay, everybody, but uh, we'll make up for it in uh, good quality content, so not to worry. Great. So as we like to start the journey uh, with every guest that we have on our show, we, we'd like to know how you get, got started in infographics. What was your backstory? Yeah, for sure, because it doesn't, it's not every day that everybody's just, you wake up one day and say, hey, I'll just make infographics. Plus, my company actually turns 12 years old this August, so back in the day, this wasn't really the kind of thing that you would think about. So my background is actually in technology, and I worked my way up all the way to being a CTO. Eventually, I just kind of saw that there was just a lot of other things that I wanted to do in marketing and just, you know, being able to explain stories right. to people that I feel like doesn't really get enough play in technology, right? Uh -huh. So eventually I left the last post that I was at. I worked for a small media place in the New York City area, which is where I'm originally from, where I'm at now, strange enough. Um, we're actually touring New York on uh, some different meetings and stuff like that this week. So in any case, I started my own company from there, and back then we were doing, you know, websites and different things like that that you'd expect in IT consulting, but back in 2005, this was pre-social and pre-everything like that, and it was, you know, after the, the bubble of the dot-com right. movement, but um, so very early on, we actually became a social media agency, so I'd say around 2006, 2007, through the 2000s, we were really specializing on that. We were the mm -hmm. first place to do some stuff for John Deere. We did some of Jay-Z's brands. There's a lot of cool stuff back in the day. But then it just got really weird when it came to social, where right. everything just exploded in every direction. And nowadays, you have people where it's like they're managing Instagram accounts for famous cats. Like, that's a thing. Like, that's an actual job that people do, right? Yeah. So I looked at what we could do, and I didn't, didn't want to be everybody. So we made a conscious decision at the end of the, two th end of the 2000s to basically say, look, instead of trying to do all of these different things and stretching ourselves thin, let's go a bit more narrow and focused. So back then, there were very few people in the world doing infographics, and I really felt like the kind of work that they were producing was lacking. It lacked the ability to actually have visual storytelling, kind of like uh -huh. having visual storytelling uh -huh. institute, as you know. Right. And the, the art wasn't really that good. There were typos in it. People wouldn't put sources, just all these different things. And we already were making a name for ourselves in social, being able to drive attention, drive traffic, go viral, crash servers, all that stuff. And we knew how to do a narrative. And we did all sorts of visual content already. And it just seemed like the next best thing to do. So we jumped in it and we said, all right, we're not going to do social anymore. We're not going to get all sorts of SEO requests and random things that stretch us thin. We're only going to do infographics. And everybody's like, yay. And what's an infographic? And I said, don't worry guys, like this is going to be a thing. And since then we haven't looked back. That's been our core specialty. We're considered one of the top firms in the nation. We've done thousands of these things, done all sorts of fortune 500s. And I think that a lot of people make this kind of mistake out there in the world where a lot of people try to go full service but they don't realize what that means, right? So if you say you're a full service marketing agency, what the heck is that? I mean, does that mean you're gonna do like street marketing, influencer marketing, email, conversion rate optimization? There's way too many things to be good at. Way too, even in the world of design, right? You could be more functional art and be industrial design and build cars. You could be a graphic designer. You could specialize in apps. You could work in VR. There's, there's too many things for people to focus on in today's world, and we need a better distribution of labor, right? So right. I just found yeah. it very early on, and we've been sticking with it. And instead of being the full service, we go end to end. So we really have kind of figured out a procedure that works very well because I feel like there's a lot of people that try to do pieces of it, but it's not quite the same thing. I see. Yeah. Oh, so, so you practically started uh, this new focus on infographics back like in the early 2000s yep. and dropped everything, all the social media or, and just kind of created a niche for yourself. And did you have the, like the, the skills or you kind of had to learn it as, as you go? 
Yeah, I feel like it's not that different from what we actually did back in the day because we used to help blog for Fortune 500 companies and get them coverage and we would have visuals in it. I would just say that maybe the art form or the delivery vehicle itself mm. has changed shape. So rather than doing, let's say, long form blogging content, which is still kind of part and parcel with an infographic, sometimes stories go alongside with it. But I think that it's just a different end product with the stack of the skill set that we've already built through the years. And I feel like every day goes by, you know, we'll make more connections in the media, just different things will continue to snowball. So it's, I, I think it's just really building on a core set of strengths, not a single strength, but it's just a, a huge stack, if you will. Yeah, I, what I really like about your story is that, you know, not only you change your focus in terms of a specialty, but you also change your location, which is kind of a, almost going to the Wild West, you know, Kentucky and, <laughs> and try to That's build true. something new, which is really interesting. Can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, I, I would actually. I find it personally very fascinating. So uh -huh. I have more than a theory because there is data to back up what I'm saying, that as the years go on, aside from when we're having like a financial meltdown and all the housing crisis and all that stuff, I think people got a lot smarter and that industry has been a little more scrutinized. Hopefully that won't happen again. Needless to say, it's very expensive to live in New York or LA or Silicon Valley or whatever. So there's all these places on the coast and I'm not knocking it, whatever, I'm a New Yorker. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. I'm kind of allowed to say it from both sides. Like I, I have a foot in both camps, if you will. Right. These places are so freaking expensive. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, if you have like a family or you want to send your kids to private school, just forgetting all that, just like housing is ridiculously expensive on the coast. And I've seen data, I've seen surveys out there where like everybody in San Francisco, like they did a survey, like 80% of like everyone in San Francisco wants to leave. You want to live in the valley, okay, great. Like everything is going to be over a million dollars, two million dollars. Yeah, and like how many people earn the money to get the house, right? Even if you have the money, what if you get fired? What if your business goes out of business? It's just, it's such a risk that I don't really like that. So I think that there's plenty of great places to live in our great country. And I've tried Louisville. Um, I wanted to also just go to a bigger, more competitive city. So I, now I live in Cincinnati. So we have bases in both places, but I live in Cincinnati. They're yeah, both yeah. wonderful places to live, great places to raise a family. And houses are cents on the dollar compared to that. Now That's think true. about being an entrepreneur, right? So yeah, everybody's yeah. like, oh, got to be lean, got to grind it, blah, blah, blah. They may be talking a good game, but it's nonsense, right? So they're just overspending really on rent. Yeah. Yeah, rent, let's say you don't have enough money to save for a house, so then you're just renting forever. There are people like they never get that, or yeah. they maybe they want to be married, they want to have kids, and they like don't have kids because it's expensive. What the heck is like? I can't abide by this stuff, dude. Right. I, right. And I have six kids, so I'm I'm speaking oh, wow. for experience. Yeah, right. yeah that's so, amazing. Yeah, so um, there was actually uh, the Atlantic has a column called City Lab, and a few uh -huh. years ago they interviewed us talking about like the steps that people take to really go and do a try for entrepreneurship because the costs of everything are so much lower, even commuting. So I'm in New York today and I'm stupidly late because it's New York and like everything sucks when it comes. Do you know, like the yeah. average commuter in New York, yep. I think it's like 90 minutes each way. That's horrible. Yeah, no, That's a part time job in and of itself. I mean, you're in Miami, yeah. right? And like, yeah. there's a lot of traffic there too. That's a big city. Yep. And I'm not, not Miami, Miami's awesome too, but I'm just saying like sometimes some of these places, it's just so ridiculous yeah, yeah. that if you're a startup, you literally have more runway by just not living in the cool places that you're supposed to be. Totally you agree. don't have to be anywhere. The world yeah. is virtual. Yeah. So, Smaller and everything's faster. Yeah, good. Sorry. So I think, you know, this is a fantastic uh, segue. I mean, now that we understand your journey, both from a you know, discipline, a focus, but also from a life of entrepreneur and how you kind of chart your own path and picking a, a, a location that is, that is also entrepreneur friendly. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe that's a good, you know, shout out for the, the folks uh, that are uh, watching this. Uh, something to consider in when you're starting your next uh, initiative or startup, you know, consider right. location. Location is right. an important variable. So now that we have uh, some, you know, basic background, can you give us like a sense, since we're talking today about infographic, how would you define infographics and, you know, how many infographic types are there? Uh, and also if you can touch on, I understand that your company invented VR, virtual reality infographics. 
Yep, sure. Uh, fabulous questions. So let's start with the first. So an infographic is literally information graphic. The problem is in today's world, nobody knows what that means. It's a buzzword and it hasn't reached full maturity. So like everybody knows what email is or SEO or what a blog is. Infographics are new to the scene. They're not even 10 years old. I mean, some people are going to argue with me on this if we open up chat and they're going to say, no, there's been maps since the 1800s and USA, blah, blah, blah. But today's modern day infographic basically came on the scene in the late 2000s. My and company think, and several think others. Do you think it has to do with the, with the fact that the internet, it's part of the internet uh, as a platform? Obviously, we had charts and maps for eons, right? But Sure. Right. And we've had cartography, which is yeah. an art in and of itself. I mean, if you've seen some right. of the old maps, they're amazing. So some of the elements of what we do in, let's just call it the modern day infographic, mm -hmm. right? So we've evolved probably on the shoulders of giants of a lot of these things. Yeah. I will tell you in our community of you know people that make infographics, there's kind of a few different things. Let's imagine it for our audience's sake as a spectrum, okay? So on one side is what we do, which I would say are called infographics. There's another side, and we can expand some of the things on the, the chart here. The other side of the coin or spectrum, if you will, is what's called the data visualization. So mm -hmm. people like uh, McCandles, people like Tuft, uh, people like that, um, to reduce it. It's almost like saying like prettier forms of charts, sorts of things. Uh, I know Dr. Cairo in your neck of the woods does yeah. a lot of things in information design and data visualizations. Yeah. So we, we both sides don't always agree because I feel like they, they serve different aspects of the world. So people buy from us and contract with us and commission us to do work primarily to go and get more audience, voice, backlinks, SEO, social movement, sales, leads, all that kind of stuff. So I would like to say that we have like very functional art that is used to make money. I would say right. data visualizations also can very much be used for that, but I think that they're much more focused on the visualization of chart data specifically, and sometimes manifest themselves into platforms such as Tableau. Sometimes we could incorporate data visualizations into what we do in information, infographics, information graphics, we can almost look at, we can almost redefine our side of what I would say we're talking about today as data journalism, right? Mm. This is trying to get in the middle of the press cycle. And I think that's a, a really good way to understand that for people. And how many types are there that you guys are producing? Sure. So it's hard to say exactly what we mean by types. So let's try to figure out how to break this down so it makes some logical sense. So first we can call an infographic is a static graphic, right? Mm -hmm. It is an image. Usually it's a PNG for loss compression. Sometimes we do a JPEG if there's a lot of photography in it. Um, I've seen a couple other image types, but those are the typical ones that you'll see out there in the world. Now, sometimes people want some level of animation in it. You can mm -hmm. make an animated GIF or this horrible word that I've seen called the gif -a graphic while I oh, just bang my head against yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it's like, it's so reductive. Come on, guys. Like, we can't come up with a better word, but animated GIF infographic. Let's just stick with that, right? Okay. So, so that is basically a giant animated GIF, but most of it isn't moving, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is an animated GIF. It's not sections of animation. I would consider that a separate type, if you will. Then there are, again, nobody agrees on terminology. So we have, some people will call it a video infographic. Some people will call it kinetic typography. Some people will call it a motion graphic, right? So some people call it an explainer video, whiteboard video. So everything that we're talking about today, I mean, can radiate out into a lot of different directions, right? Oh, As I'm sure you can imagine. So we've got the static, we've got the sort of motion, we've got the full motion. Then we also have something called an interactive infographic, which is sort of similar to video, but rather than hitting the play button in a video or watching an animated gift, you can actually interact with it. You can click and scroll and drag. There can be computational parts in it where you can input things. Those are very cool, but I would, I'd like to think that we'd all be doing more of them in this day and age, but the internet still kind of sucks. And Especially if you're on mobile and the, you know, the Wi-Fi is not that good. So I feel like sometimes it's not really great to do experiences like that until all of our technology, so the laptops and tablets and mobile things that we use, and maybe when we start getting into more of augmented reality and virtual reality, where we're not tied to these stupid keyboards and laptop screens and all that stuff, where we're basically wearing our computers, that I think we're really going to get into the next edge, which brings me into your next question. Yeah, so last year we pioneered the world's first um, 
sort of interactive, but we're going to just call it the VR infographic. Okay. Um, I feel very much that that industry suffers a great deal because everybody is always doing these proof of concepts and let's just do stories and let's do films, but that's selling it short. It's content, right? For doctor's offices, if you need to look and, you know, do brain surgery together and gather around it, or if you're in real estate, or if you're in virtually anything, right? It can apply to any kind of industry. I feel like there needs to be a narrative, there needs to be content. And soon, when we're not staring at our laptops and just going over the basic internet through our web browser, I mean, you saw the Apple announcement, they're baking VR right into the new computers, right? Yep. Um, Apple's has all sorts of patents. They're going to be doing all sorts of crazy things with headsets. There's all sorts of different people out there. There's a lot of people making better visual optics stuff. So I know there's a place in Israel called Loomis. They're doing a lot of cool tech out there. Uh, there's just great people that aren't just doing films and not just games, but are actually getting ready to do content rated things. So, I think so we're still a little ways off, but go ahead. Sorry. So what is the user experience looks like, you know, when you talk about VR infographics, does the user needs to kind of wear like a Google Cardboard and kind of work, work like look around and see, you know, interactive or, or static uh, infographic uh, data? Yeah, it's very much, much more of a static experience that's overlaid within the VR. So yeah, if you had a Google Cardboard, uh, Google has a better thing now called Daydream. So there's a bunch of, you know, just relatively low-fi things that you can wear that are very inexpensive. I see. I'm more excited about augmented reality, honestly, because I don't want to just be in a box where I'm covered. Like this does not, this doesn't make for a good show, right? Like if I just put my hands over myself. Right. But if I had cool glasses that I could still see you and project things into the world around me, to, in my world, that's much more interesting. So we're still waiting for the technology and the speed yeah. to catch up. I don't know how much you've seen some of the installations on these things, but they always have these big clunky headsets with all sorts yeah, of yeah, wires. Yeah. It's not really mobile insane amounts of processing power so we're like getting the, there like I the mean, block, it's very it's like, experimental it's like the block yeah. uh, phone if you remember the mobile phone, right. The block phone. yeah right like the, the briefcase that you have in the car yeah right? yeah, yeah, yeah so, so we're at briefcase level unfortunately for the most part there it. were people that will disagree with me but it's just so much of it is not there yet and like i'm dude i'm at the edge of my seat i can't wait until we get there in the world it's going to be a very exciting time because we have not improved on the human computer, you know, HCI, human computer interface for decades, right? Yeah. I mean, look, look at the laptop. It might be slimmer and faster, but you still basically have a TV screen, some kind of mouse and a keyboard. Yeah, that's why Stuff. everybody's waiting right now for Magic Leap announcement to kind of kill the yes. computing industry and, yeah. you know, go away with there. the screens. Yeah. yeah, they're in your neck of the woods, aren't they, right? Yeah, they're just like a 40 hour, But they're super hour, secret. Hour. Like nobody knows what they're Yeah, yeah, super secretive, mm -hmm. yeah. So now that we got a sense of, uh, you know, the different types of infographics uh, and how, what is the basic definition of infographics, can you talk from a, since you, you mentioned earlier that uh, most of your clients mm -hmm. come to you with a goal of uh, using infographics for marketing. So what would you say are the top business objectives that clients are after? Sure. So before I answer that, I feel like a lot of people say, okay, so here is our one sheet, go make it pretty. And I say, no, nope, we're not doing any of that. Yeah. Sometimes people don't listen. To, you know, you can't force people to listen to you, but the people who are open to actually doing the things that will be money and resources, they get a whole range of different things out of this, right? So they get to explain the industry or the industry according to them or their product or where they fit in the market. And they can get a lot more subtle, a lot more psychological, and all on the earned media side. This isn't press releases, this isn't sponsored content. We don't need to go there because we can make messaging that's so attractive to people that they don't want to look away. There's right. a good stat out there that says that you only have 2.5, 2.7 seconds to get somebody's attention online and we have like less of attention span than a goldfish. Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. people with that top piece of the infographic really get somebody's attention and no joke, people will sit there for let's say three, three and a half minutes and totally just sit there and just read the whole thing. It's really great. Hmm, interesting. So would, so would you say that basically the business objectives are for the most part under the earned media side is really driving awareness. It's kind of the top of the final play in a sense, like the consideration piece. Yes and no. So yes, you're correct. Top of funnel awareness, Yep. front of mind, you know, the moment in time and all of that. Absolutely. But 
it also can drive direct sales and leads because if we get it shared into some of the biggest publications in the world that then, you know, thousands and thousands of people descend on it and social and all of that. And I can show you, you know, we can do some show recap notes. There are yeah. pieces that legitimately for half a decade plus are still continuing to share. I actually just had somebody reach out to us that we're doing work for that saw a piece that we did, I think about five years ago. So there's people that are seeing things for the first time that are five, six, seven years old. Oh, wow. So I think, you know, you compare that to SEO, PR, you know, all these PPC, all these different things that you'd spend money for. And the second you stop spending money, they just go away. I feel like this is something that gives companies an opportunity to make enduring content. Let me say that again, enduring content. So content is king, all that. We, we have all these fancy words, but if you think about enduring content, content that you can stay evergreen and relevant, but looks so good and tells such a good story. That right. Somebody that didn't see it five years ago, wasn't on the internet, maybe they were in college, other news cycle that can just continuously go viral. Like we have a I piece see. that I think every day is still viral and stumble upon and never stops because it's just like in like one of their top things ever, right? So when you have things like that, what kind of company wouldn't want something like that to happen, right? Right. So as so part of your it's, engagement. It's the whole funnel. Yeah. As, as you're part of the engagement, you produce the piece and you're also responsible for the distribution? Yes, exactly. So like we talked about before, so not full service, but end to end. So we do everything from coming up with a concept mm -hmm. or actually multiple concepts, multiple little story arc narratives that we know will do well in the media. Then we go back to the client and we say, here's all our ideas. Let's pick one together. Then we have three teams. We have a research team, we have a design team, we have a promotions team. So research does both the actual research, duh, that's why it's called the research team, but also they do the storytelling because just a bunch of facts and figures suck. Like nobody trusts data, right, man? I mean, 86% of all stats are made up on the spot. Anybody can falsify data, you can put together a survey, you can skew all the results. You know, if uh, Microsoft is writing a history book, Apple is not gonna show up. You know, right. like data is so subjective and so easily manipulated. But when you marry it together with a story, it really takes on a new life of its own. So that's the first thing, we build a blueprint, go ahead. And just to kind of make sure our audience is clear, when you say storytelling, obviously, you know, this is what we live and breathe here at VSI, but is your intention also basically that the content is presented in a format of a setting conflict resolution type of flow? Or sure. do you have other definition for storytelling? Right. I mean, I would say very much like you're saying, like with a funnel mentality, we look at a very funneled approach where the top piece has to be perfect. So we argue sometimes very loudly. <laughs> if the team is watching this, I'm sure they can agree and everybody will nod. And sometimes I drive everybody crazy and just can't let go where it's like, no, like the title has to be perfect. Like mm -hmm. this isn't right. We're not feeling it. Right. Um, there's even tools out there that you can run titles and get like a title score that are pretty cool that we can share later too. Oh, so wow. yeah, so top of funnel is just so important. People need to spend a ton of time to literally sit there, come up with a title. Like, you know the site Upworthy? Upworthy, I think, <laughs> does multivariate testing on like 30 different titles or something crazy. I mean, there are companies out there that spend hours just agonizing over the title which is why we're agonizing over that even just on the show, that it's so super important to get that title right. The start of the story is going to make or break your success. And then we have to pair that to the visuals. What kind of narrative are we telling both from a words perspective, a data perspective, and a visual perspective? So we spend a lot of time on that, and the teams actually work together. So the researchers that are writing up the story aren't just doing it in a vacuum, because let's say the designers look at it and say, well, this is crap, or I don't understand that, or I don't agree with it. So they have to be happy. And then the people who are going to promote it into the media are going to say, guys, like, this is boring. This sucks. This is like a good idea five oh, years wow. ago. No, no. So everybody like really just cross trains on it. Not that everybody's doing everybody's job, but it's very interconnected or it just doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. No, this is cool. And, and how much uh, these programs uh, run for just to give a sense to our audience? Pricing, yeah. um, it's pretty custom. I mean, I know there are people that are cheaper out there, but I think you get what you pay for. A lot of people come to us because we're able to get just insane amounts of press for people that mm -hmm. they don't have to like even have PR places sometimes. So we're generally like single digit 
high thousands. So generally like five, 10 grand. And Mm -hmm. there are people that are less. And I know there's like the do it yourself tools, but come on, man. Like, do you build your own car? Do you build your own house? You're not going to get results from like templates usually. And again, I'm outspoken and people will can argue with me all day, but they're wrong probably. And you, (laughs) information's going so quickly. Journalists are over capacity. People need something that at a quick look makes sense, but has an insane amount of data that sells it and looks beautiful. So we just fit the mark and have a lot of great relationships. So that's really what comes to mind there. Cool. So when you think back about uh, your work uh, in the infographic space, can you pick up maybe one or two examples that uh, you really like and explain why, just so we get a sense of what makes yeah. a successful infographics from your opinion? Absolutely. So one of, I would say, the crowd favorites out there, I'm not sure it's like my favorite design ever, but that's beside the point. I think it tells the story of your question quite well. So if anybody does a Google search for the psychology of color, they will see this very colorful piece with color wheels and a bunch of paint swatches on it and all of that. So you're probably five, six years ago, a painting company. Now paint is boring, right? Like behind you, it's like, there's a phrase like watching paint dry. Paint is not super sexy. What are you even going to do? So the company comes to us and they're like, all right, um, we see that you do this great work. We want that for us. Go make us stars. And we're like, okay, I mean, you're a painting company. We'll do what we can. So we did everything from the conceptualization, doing all the research, doing all the storytelling, implementation, obviously design, implementation, promotion. And it caught fire on the internet. That Remember the one that I said just never stops on upon. I mean, yeah. I've seen it. Like, I don't even know how many tens or millions of people have seen it organically. It's been in basically like every mom blog, every interior designer, anybody in real estate, everybody who has to do with paint, Pantone Institute, who's picked up in National Geographic, Yahoo Homes, like all over the internet and it never stops. Uh, the, believe it or not, the week that it came out and like the first week it came out, it just caught fire like crazy. Google and Adobe both called us on the phone and they're like, we don't know what you did with the internet, but like go do some of that. And that's crazy, right? Because like Adobe like makes Photoshop and Illustrator, the things that we actually use to make the product. Right. Like right. they need us for, but we do work for these companies. And I mean, it's just such a, an enduring thing. And it's about, to tell you what the piece is about, rather than like a brag sheet of how this paint company is better than the other paint company, painting is a commodity, right? Like what kind of milk do you get at the store? Like right. maybe like right. if you look at the red cap, you look and you know, you make sure it's not a hundred dollars and you check the expiration date, hopefully, or you're drinking bad milk. But painting is a commodity. Painting is a gallon of milk. This made them not a gallon of milk. This gets them money. This gets them at the top of search engines. Everybody sees this everywhere. People print it out. People even figure out what color to paint their house. Talk about buying and not top of funnel based on some of the things and data points that are in that infographic. So I think oh, wow. the ability to rewire a person's mind like that to not just top of funnel, but straight into sales and the education within a product before you even see them, I think is pretty legendary. So I would say that's definitely one that was very cool. So and then, you, yeah, it sounds like, you know, the painting infographic was really successful because of a, the topic was super, you know, interesting for a lot of people. And then, Obviously, the, the execution, the content itself, the way it mm-hmm. was actually structured, that kind of the spike in interest. Exactly. Yep. Totally. Um, I could go on in a few other tangents. Uh, yeah, just um, give, give another see. example if you have. Sure. So sometimes I feel like different communities spark interest. So some, sometimes it could be more niche networks and mom blogs and you know smaller sites. Sometimes it can be huge media sites. And sometimes it could be like a whole like crazy underground. Mm-hmm. So let me tell you another one that happened fairly recently, um, just earlier this year, that was just crazy. So um, there was sometimes we have clients that see our creativity and they let us kind of do free reign with whatever ideas that we really think might just go on fire. So it was a cannabis related piece where it talks about like how a pe- people can like medicate themselves through cannabis. Right. Now you wouldn't think that that's the thing that the mainstream news media would cover. That seems like, you know, maybe they're going to be a little more conservative. That's not so buttoned up and stuff for them. So we got it onto a bunch of different websites and you know, you've heard of anonymous, you know, like the, the hacker Alliance people. Yeah. Okay. So anonymous has like news channels. So sometimes they say we're going to hack somebody to pieces, but they actually have news channels where they share content. 
and Ooh. they shared this piece across their networks. And then I started seeing it blow up all over Facebook. They have like a Facebook page with like 9,000, no, sorry, 9 million people. There's some other page with like 20 million people picked it up. So like by the time I stopped counting, it was like, I don't even know what it's up to now, but it was something like collective, like 60, 60 70 million people on Facebook. We're sharing this all over collective likes oh, across wow. all these pages. And the weird thing on that was it wasn't all mainstream media, right? So things can just take different turns. And it's interesting too, that sometimes it depends on the kind of industry. So if we're gonna do something that's colorful, well, that does really well in social media. It does really well in like homes and interior decorators and real estate people and all that. Sometimes we do things that are much more for businesses and entrepreneurs or finance. We've done things in sports that have done really well. It's just all over the map. So we've figured out through the years really how to kind of make things radiate into different kinds of press, whether it's kind of the underground or the mainstream or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I think, and I would stress for anybody who's thinking about this in terms of how to get your word out there, don't just make stuff for one industry, right? So some of these things I'm saying, it's not just a business outlet publication, but it may be finance and startups and social and green. And you know, there's so many crossover audiences to shoot for that you should be thinking about at the start of your engagement. And I feel like that's some of our larger success when we're able to kind of make things that a lot of people can relate to. Yeah, it, it sounds like, you know, from that angle, your company is not only just uh, focusing on the infographic uh, design, but actually has a kind of a powerful PR engine because that's the other part of the equation, you know, promoting mm -hmm. that piece. And, you know, if you cannot really promote it effectively, then nobody is going to know. Yeah, then you just have like a pretty picture and like lots of people can do that yeah. for you. It's not enough of a, a yeah. leverage skill set in my mind. And, you know, you mentioned PR, I would say kind of like we talked about the, the spectrum of infographics on one side and just more data visualization on the other. I would like to think that what my agency does, show me, is it's sort of like a weird hybrid between PR on one side and SEO on the other, because we're very cognizant of how these places work. And there's a lot of gaps between the two industries, right? So SEOs are a lot more technical. They're looking at link building. They're looking yep. at a lot of on-page optimization, all these different things. And PR might just be looking for media hits and they're not yep. looking at, you know, how things are linked and all that. So I feel like sometimes we can really be a very effective bridge between organizations that they can get really excited about and get great results so they can all help each other. Yeah. So, so this is a great day, uh, actually, fantastic transition to my next question. So now that we understand Great. a little bit about uh, the world of infographics, you give us some examples, the end-to-end -end process. So how would you measure success of an infographic program? Obviously, you, you talked a, earlier about the business objectives. Maybe you, if you can give us a sense of what are their success criteria. Absolutely. And it's a very important question because if you can't measure success, how do you know if you're successful, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're not, again, we're not just putting pretty pictures on the internet. We're putting out pretty pictures that make money. Now we can't always translate it into direct dollars because sometimes it could be a long sales cycle. I'm not responsible for the company's overall integrated marketing efforts. Maybe they're not, maybe their landing pages aren't good. I mean, there's, there's too much complication that's outside the realm of this question. But the question is, how do we measure success so that we can show clients that something's successful? So I would say the best indicator that I've seen to date is high quality inbound links. It's not the be all end all measuring stick of everything, but I think that's a really good yardstick. So when we are done with an engagement, after we're done promoting, we actually hand people over a report that actually shows all of the different places that we've had pick up the story and we organize it by something called domain authority. So for the uninitiated, uh, domain authority or DA is a metric that was started by what used to be called SEO Moz, but they changed to Moz when they uh, pivoted away from like being an SEO in, um, agency and now they're more of basically a tools company for the SEO industry. So right. DA is yeah. really good because it basically gives you a very quick measuring stick. Again, it's not perfect. Remember like Alexa rank back in the day? Oh, yeah. It's kind of like a version of that, but it's a scale from one to a hundred. So if your website sucks, it's a one. If it's Google, it's a hundred. <laughs> yeah. So we're always trying yeah. to shoot for, you know, if you're on like Forbes or Entrepreneur or Huffington Post or National Geographic or Upworthy or NASDAQ or wherever we're in, you know, the more well-known sites are probably very high on the list, 
but it's not only getting the highest ones, it's also getting things that are relevant, it's getting things that are driving traffic, it's a niche audience sometimes, influencers, bloggers. So it's really just hitting things on so many stripes because when we start promoting, we're getting the word out everywhere. Plus, we, we write for a number of different publications. We're able to get things out to some of our audiences. Um, you know, you mentioned I'm on the a board at Google, so sometimes I'm able to get some things through some of Google small business channels. So yeah, it just kind of depends on the nature of the engagement. But I think that's the best thing because a lot of people say, well, what about social shares? I'm like, yeah, you want to like go call some dude in you know like the Philippines that's going to make a bunch of fake likes? That's crap. It's too easily engineered. None of this stuff is any nonsense like that. So. It's all earned media. We're not like paying people under the table, getting everything lit on fire and thrown in the garbage. And this you don't really use paid just, media either, right? Not so, at all, correct. We want to present that we are beyond reproach. So the second we start playing with paid media, I don't know, I think other things can be manipulated. So we recommend to our clients, if you want to augment anything we're doing with paid media, that's you, we're, we only focus on just straight up earned media. That's our specialty. Because again, you want focus. If we start doing paid media, we have to have a whole department of like media buying and stuff. It just doesn't yeah. seem like it's necessary for what we do. And we're able to catch fire. And this is, uh, let me add, this is especially valuable for let's say a larger brand. So if you're a big Fortune 500, the second you start going to all the big publications, all the business development people will approach you and say, oh yes, here's all the sponsored content, blah, blah, blah. And that's okay. I'm not knocking it, but it's like, Sometimes it costs a lot of money and it's not a guarantee that people are going to read or buy or click and that sucks. So we're able to just say, look, here's a compelling story that we know, we know your audience because we worked with you for years here and then they run it. And then the brand's like, how did you do that? It's like, because we know what they want. That's, it's not rocket science. It's just hard. Right. right? It doesn't right. scale so easily. Yeah. So, so you said it, in a nutshell, you know, the top KPI is really, you know, the, the volume of the, uh, backlinks mm -hmm. from that uh, infographic piece do you, yes. do you get any requirements for people for conversions like sometimes it depends on the industry right so sometimes a company might have lead generation sometimes they have different metrics I, I mean obviously i can't discuss some client things that are part of their process some people have very strict kpis um, some people just have it set that they want to be in a specific publication. So a lot of people have just different ideas about how things come from performance. Uh, a lot of people may be on like page two in Google and they just want to get break into page one. A lot of people, it's so hard to say, right? It's, it's all over the world because we work with places everywhere and a lot of people think of this differently. And I think also what's interesting. So some people are like, well, why isn't social a benchmark? Yeah. And to my answer that it's like, well, it is. When we get something on, you know, like if we get something on Inc and then Inc runs it on their Facebook page that has 2 million people, well, there is your social proof, right? Like some people are like, well, can we put it on our social channel? And they have like 80 followers. I'm like, yeah, sure. That, but that's like, that's not yeah. what we're depending on. It's going on a specific landing page or blog post that's a lightning rod that all the other places are going to pile on, whether it's social shares, whether it's linking to reblogging it, whatever, right? That's what we're doing there. I see. Yeah. So, so when you mentioned lead generation, just a kind of follow up question, do you have infographics where you have like a, like a data capture mechanism embedded in the infographics? Right. So usually how that works is that's working on the landing page. Sometimes that's working on the embed code. Sometimes there's lead capture form. And this is a question that can divert into a lot of different directions. It kind of just depends on how the client is set up and what, what they're trying to do because that it's a lot of variables to it. We try to keep the landing pages quite simple. I think sometimes people get the wrong idea and they over clutter it. And I say, guys, like it's more important that they enjoy this content, stick around and go for more. Every right. now and then we'll get into a fight where people will want to like put like a, a lead gen paywall to even see the infographic. It's like, what are you doing? Come on. Like yeah. that world's over. They want to see the content. Sometimes we give in. It's like, all right, fine. Here's like a snippet of it. And you have to like put in your information at the end. It's fine. I don't really believe in that. I, I think a better tactic if you really want that is maybe you have like a higher quality PDF to go download it and print it. Mm. Like we just did a piece that was all about the cybersecurity industry talking about phishing attacks. I mean, you've seen all the stuff in the news. It's, it's a nightmare right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody wanted this because it had so much information about how to identify if you're getting screwed on an email that, you know, tons of people wanted the printable so the company is like great let's put up a form if you want this in print form nice like little uh i think it was like letter size or something 
So everybody wanted that and that was a great success. And now that helps their lead gen engine like crazy, right? Like they've been doing really well off of that. Right, right. All right, so another question that uh, I'm sure you've been thinking about quite uh, a lot as a business owner yep. is, uh, what do you think about, uh, what is the future of data storytelling in terms of style, content, tools, audiences? Yeah, um, I think about that a lot. I, a lot of people say like, oh, so you're in the infographic business. I'm like, yes, but I like to think that I, I kind of am in the what do people want in the next three to five year business. I think right. that that's a better question because as you've correctly said, I mean, yes, it's infographics, but it's delivery to do a thing. So I think as the web evolves and matures, I mean, we got into social in 2006, we got into infographics in late 2008 or something. So I'm always trying to get into stuff early. So I think the next thing that I'm watching very closely is AR and VR. I think yeah. that's where it's at because it's going to fundamentally change the pipeline of computing power that you need, the way that you interact with computers, and the internet pipeline that you're going to need to push all of this stuff in. So it's very complicated. There's a lot of smart people working on it. And I thought, you know, if we had this conversation in March of last year, I would have been like, you know, smiling a lot more and excited, but I, I'm fr almost frowning a little because I, I'm not saying it's a dead industry, but I would never say that, but it's, it's just slower than I think a lot of analysts predicted. I mean, I just uh -huh. saw in TechCrunch today, there's a, some kind of, some kind of like AR glasses place had like 15 million in funding that just shut down. Yeah, no, I think the Apple announcement that they plan to oh, yeah, that made it go way AR, up. You know that's going to lower the you know barrier to entry to a lot of people, and th that's right. I think the missing thing because most people require to download and install a mobile app in order to yeah it's stupid it's, yeah so and then to have all this other clunky hardware I mean look at our lives funny right like everybody's got like maybe you don't have a desktop anymore maybe you just have a laptop but you have some kind of thing that we'll call a computer yeah. then you probably have a tablet or two and then you probably have a phone. So yeah. you're telling me now I have to buy another contraption for another hundreds of dollars? It's not just not practical. Okay, yeah. so some people might also have a gaming system. So like PlayStation is super smart. I don't know if you've seen PlayStation VR. That's super, that's very attractive. We were messing around with it with some folks um, this week. And it just, it looks cool. It's got a lot of lights on it. But a lot of these contraptions, you basically would look like a complete moron walking around on the street. Yeah. And that's part of what's wrong with it. So we have to get to a place where it's comfortable to wear. It doesn't make you fall over and make you want to vomit. And it just doesn't look like you're an idiot. Like remember Google Glass, that kind of crash and burn. And you looked like an idiot and everybody was afraid that you're going to like be recording them. So we just, we have to get the appearance right. We have to make people feel comfortable. Do you remember back in like the dot com? I, I don't mean to divert too much, but I think appearances are so important. Since we are talking about visual storytelling, I, right. I would be remiss not to bring this up. Do you remember back in the dot com days? Do you remember the Aaron chairs that Herman Miller made? Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Those? Right. Yep. So they changed the game on chairs. And why are we even talking about this? Well, in the early days when they were doing product testing, people didn't want to sit on the chair because on the ground. And they had to like re-educate the world that you don't have to sit in upholstered <laughs> furniture cushions. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's kind of crazy, right? So appearances sometimes are everything. I guarantee you, you talk to a hundred people in Miami, I'm in New York right now, I could walk around downtown and like have some big VR headset and people would be like, I don't want to wear that, I'm gonna look stupid. And like yeah. somebody's gonna tap you on the shoulder and the AR stuff is getting better because at least it's glasses that you can see instead of being in a box. And we're getting there, man. We're getting there where it's going to eventually, it'll just be like maybe a little piece of glass. Um, people have patents on uh, contact lenses. It could be part of your glasses. So we're, we're close, but I, I don't know the date, but that's where this is going. And that's what we want to be a part of. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. So I want to kind of uh, finish up with the, uh, if you, you know, we have a bunch of uh, marketers, digital uh, folks that watching us, if you can give us a, you know, your top three tips, you know, for people that would like to start, a, you know, their journey with infographics, you know, what would they need to do? Like just to make sure, sure that the experience is super successful. Absolutely. So I would say don't cut corners and know your audience, right? So we spend a lot of time and money and people doing all of these things. So it, it's not really like a one man band kind of a thing. 
because there's so many different parts of your brain you need to activate. A lot of people get the wrong ideas about infographics. And a lot of people just think, I'm a designer, so I can automatically do it. No, somebody, even if it's not yourself, has to research, has to summarize. You can't count on the client to do that, right? The client is busy making their widgets and they can't build the house for you. Right. So you have to be very cognizant of that. What's that story going to look like? Nail that down. It's not a listicle of five bullet points and now we're going to throw a little stupid bathroom symbols on it. No. It should look really good. And it, So well-researched, well well-thought-out, good story, good design because there's too much crappy design, and figure out something that will be relevant in today's world. So you could have the best story and the most beautiful thing, but if it's like so super snooze or just too cerebral and out there. I mean, I like, I'm very fond of telling people that the internet is an eighth grader, right? Yeah. It's just like, it likes memes and fart jokes and stuff like that. The internet's not that smart. Like we just have a habit of just being like not super, yeah, whatever, that's what we're dealing with. So everybody's kind of in a rush and we'll click around the internet. We have, it's more like a funny or die kind of audience kind of a thing, right? So we have to be cognizant of that, that we're not reading, you know, we can have like a master's thesis over here and we can have a cat on the treadmill here. What's so going to win? So that gotta, cat is going to kick its ass, right? So you, you want to make sure basically knowing your audience, uh, having an awesome design and also think about how to cutify it a little bit just because of what you said that the internet folks are really looking for those cutie, uh, elements that might uh, you know spike attention yeah you definitely have some you have to have some kind of angle it can't just be a story something's got to turn people on there has to be I always try to put an ele a visual element on there that people remember and I think that that's important too so just be memorable in some way I see yeah all right this is fantastic Brian I really enjoyed uh, our chat and we can definitely close close with that and maybe Brian, can you maybe tell our audience uh, how they can reach out to you, where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously on our website, nowsourcing.com, not outsourcing, but N-O-W, sourcing.com. Yeah. And you'll see us on social pretty much everywhere at Now Sourcing. We've got that name. Awesome, good stuff. Yeah. And, and just so you know, this uh, broadcast is gonna be posted on our website and uh, we're gonna add a lot of uh, assets, examples, tidbits that uh, Brian is going to share. So we're going to make it uh, more interactive. Uh, this is uh, how we actually produce uh, this show. So the first part is the interactive video uh, documentation. They, and we also going to use uh, this content and put it on our podcast program. So you can actually catch it on both uh, platforms. Outstanding. All right. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Shwami. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy. Been a pleasure. All right. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Bye.